kind of spent a couple weeks looking at the, uh, the ministry of the Apostle Paul and, and, and uh, Barnabas on the island of Cyprus. And, uh, and we see the first Gentile um, recorded uh, coming to faith, uh, the deputy of, of, the, of the island, and, uh, and the blinding of the Elimaeus, the sorcerer, Jew. And uh, the picture of that is the doctrine that Paul is out proclaiming, and that is the, that God has blinded Israel and has turned to the Gentiles. And we have in, in this belief of the deputy in verse 12, then the deputy, when he saw what was done, believed, being astonished at the doctrine of the Lord, that we have a Gentile being saved apart from the nation of Israel. And most people have never studied their Bible enough to realize that the whole purpose of God's program for the nation of Israel is that through Israel all the nations of the earth would be blessed. Well here's a guy being blessed apart from the nation of Israel. That's the difference between the gospel of the circumcision and the gospel of the uncircumcision. The gospel of the circumcision is there's going to be salvation in this earth through the nation of Israel according to God's prophetic program and His purpose for the nation of Israel. The gospel of the uncircumcision is that God today is doing something different. And that is saving people uh, apart from the nation of Israel, uh, apart from the covenants of Abraham and David and the nation of Israel, and directly through the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. And, uh, and so this Gentile, he believed apart from, because the Jew is actually trying to prevent him, and it's what Paul said about the Jews in Romans chapter 2, that God's name is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. And certainly this Jew blasphemed the name of the true God in that island uh, by his sorcery and by his apostasy and uh, his false prophesying. And, uh, but the deputy nonetheless comes to faith. So we, we end that and, and that, that ministry there on, on the island of Cyprus ends. Verse 13 says, Now when Paul and his company loose from Paphos, uh, they came to Perga in Pamphylia, and John departed from them, John departing from them, returned to Jerusalem. So, just so that you got the picture of where things are, is they've been on this island of Cyprus from one end to the other, and they're leaving Paphros, which is the western, yeah, the western end of Cyprus, and they're going straight north to the mainland. They're going to land in Perga, which is the seacoast city, in an area here called Pamphylia, but they're not going to stay there long. And then, uh, but, but that's where they're at, so that you can see that they've gone through the island of Cyprus, and then they now come to a new territory, and uh, they're, they're going to begin to minister in that area. Now that area, uh, we call, the Bible calls this area, that, well actually the, the, the western end of that area, that calls it Asia. That's where Ephesus and those is but he's not quite over in the western area. We call this whole territory here on a, on a modern day map, that's Turkey. That whole area is Turkey. So he's coming into the bottom part of that, but that, that bottom region and all the cities that it's going to call, co cover is called the region of Galatia. And, uh, and so when they, well, I'll show you the verse in a little bit about that being called the region of Galatia. And that's where, when he writes in the book of Galatians, the churches of Galatia. He doesn't say the church of Galatia, the churches of, because that's a region. And there's going to be several different churches he's going to plant in that area. And when you read about the book of Galatians, the, that's the churches in that area there. And so he's going to, he, he looses from Paphros and he comes to Perga and Pamphylia. But soon as they landed... <laughs> in that area. As soon as they got off the boat and hit that seacoast city of Perga in Pamphylia, <laughs> oh it's over here, <laughs> in Pam that it tells us in, at the end of verse 13 there, and John departing from them returned to Jerusalem. Now th that's a significant detail, one that we could actually study later, but there's some important parts to that, that when it says that he departed, departing, when he departed from them, he actually left them cold. He is actually deserting Barnabas and Paul. Uh, I, I always say this because <laughs> just of the connections of the things we've seen. Uh, I always say he went home to mama. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and the reason we know that, 
go back to chapter 12. Now, uh, for, before I re- remember what it said, John departing from them returned to Jerusalem. So if you go back into chapter 12, when we first were introduced to John, Peter had, uh, had uh, got out of prison. The angel helped him escape. And it says in verse 12, And when he had considered the thing, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, where many were gathered together praying. So when he goes to Jerusalem, Mama lives at Jerusalem. That's why I always say return to Mama. And he's in the house. Now, whether he's you know, living there or just there in the prayer meeting, uh, the fact that he got so far outside of Jerusalem... Uh, when Paul left, you know, Paul was in Jerusalem during the time of Peter's escape from prison. And you read in chapter 12 and verse 25, And Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they had fulfilled their ministry and took with them John, whose surname was Mark. So when they left Jerusalem, now Paul had come, he had established a work up here in Antioch. He was down in Jerusalem. Now that's quite a ways there. That's what, 140 something miles or so. I forget exactly what that is. But anyhow, when they left Jerusalem and came back to Antioch, they took John Mark. When they they left there and and began their their ministry in chapter 13, verses 1-2, you get down to verse uh, 5 of chapter 13, it says, And when they were at Salamis, they preached the word of God in the synagogue of the Jews, and they had also John to their minister. So when they left Antioch, and went to Cyprus, the eastern end of Cyprus is Salamis. They're going to go right, they're going to go all the way through Cyprus to Paphos on the western end. Then they're going to go up to Perga and Pamphylia. And at that point, John says, I had enough. <laughs> and he leaves them. Now when you understand that he, he, he was there to minister to their need, then you understand that, that when, he, when it says that he departed, it wasn't a, a pleasant, like, uh, well, thanks for being with us. He, he left them in a lurch. Look, look over chapter 15. He says, it says in verse 36 of chapter 15. Now this is, they're going to finish their apostolic journey. They're going to make a trip to Jerusalem and explain uh, their ministry to the Gentiles, to the 12 apostles. And then they're going to plan to revisit the churches that were just about where we haven't even yet studied that they established. <laughs> So in verse 36, it says, Some days after, Paul said to Barnabas, Let us go again and visit our brethren in every city where we preached the word of the Lord and see how they do. And Barnabas determined to take with them John, whose surname was Mark. But Paul thought it not good to take with them who departed from from them from Pamphylia and went not with them to the work. So you realize he didn't just leave... he didn't stay in there and stick it out when the work had to be done. And, and so, and, and, and Barnabas, you know, we talk about the relationship. I think Mark is his son and Paul's his uncle. But, but whatever the case is, Barnabas wants to give him another chance here. And Paul thought it not good. It, it, look at verse 39. And the contention was so sharp between them that they departed asunder one from the other. So Barnabas took Mark and sailed to Cyprus. That's where Mark ministered with him before. And, and Paul chose Silas and departed, being recommended by the brethren unto the grace of God. And he, he went through Syria and Cilicia, confirming the churches. He went another direction. They went out into Cyprus. He goes up through the land territory and works his way over to Galatia. And that's what you're going to read in chapter 16. But so sharp was this division because of Mark that Paul and Barnabas no longer minister together after this point. So when, when we read over there in, in chapter 13, uh, uh, said, and John departing from them returned to Jerusalem, that was a tough situation. And, and the, the, what, what I mean by that is certainly it was tough to the Apostle Paul. When John was there for their ministering, he's particularly ministering to the Apostle Paul. Paul had some physical needs. And this was like the errand boy that's going to take care of his needs so he can do the work of the ministry. Um, now you're probably familiar with that. It, uh, before we leave there, look, look at Acts chapter 16. I told you I was going to show you these verses. It, this is the future. We're, we're, we'll get to these studies later. But when they, 
had that division and Paul takes Silas and goes, it says in chapter 16, verse 1, Then came he to Derbe and Lystra, and, and behold, a certain disciple was uh, there named Timotheus, the son of a certain woman, which is Jewish, and believed, and his father was a Greek. So he, they, they go into those areas, and it starts naming cities that we're about to study. And when you look over in verse 6, it says, Now when they had gone throughout Phygia and the region of Galatia, they were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia. So I, I just want you to see that when he goes backtracking to the churches he already established, and he starts naming cities that were, we haven't even yet studied because we haven't fo followed his ministry there, but that when he names those cities, they are called the region of Galatia. Now, come to the book of Galatians. Galatians chapter 4. This is the book I was referring to. Verses 1 and 2 of chapter 1. Verse 2 of chapter 1 says, And all the brethren which are with me unto the churches of Galatia. I just, so that you realize there's several different churches because Galatia is a region. And it's the region that, he's, that we're about to see him evangelize and then go back and start churches in. But anyhow, he has to write them a letter because they started departing from the faith because people are trying to put them back under the gospel of circumcision rather than them taking a stand for the gospel of the uncircumcision. But, but that being the case, over chapter 4 and verse 13, when Paul is dealing with them, he says in verse 13 of chapter 4, he says, Ye know how through infirmity of the flesh I preached the gospel unto you at the first. Now that's, about, that's what we're about to study. When he preached the gospel unto them at the first, he had an infirmity in the flesh. We, well, let's just read on. It says, And my temptation, which was in my flesh, ye despise not, nor rejected, but receive me as an angel of God, even as Christ Jesus. Where is then... The, boat, the blessedness ye spake of. For I bear you record that if it were possible, ye would have plucked out your own eyes and have given them, given them to me. Am I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? They zealously affect you. And that's the people that's turning them, trying to turn them away from the Apostle Paul. They affect them, but not well. Uh, they would exclude you that ye might affect them, that ye might affect them. But it is good to be zealously affected always in a good thing, and not only when I am present with you. So the Apostle Paul, he's encouraging them to stay on track. And be careful, these people are trying to draw them away. But when he talked about when he was with them and he had this infirmity in the flesh, he makes that statement in verse 15. I bear you record that if it were possible, ye would have plucked out your own eyes and have given them to me. So that, it, I mean, it, to me it doesn't seem hard to see that whatever infirmity he had in the flesh, it, it was his eyes. Even the fact that when it says in verse 14, And my temptation which was in my flesh, ye despised not, nor rejected. That there's something wrong with his eyes that maybe even to look at him, you know, it might not be a comfortable. Uh, you know, like if he was standing here preaching, everyone goes, what's wrong with that guy's eyes? <laughs> you know, distract you. But he said, but you receive me as an angel of God, even as Jesus Christ, because he was there speaking the words of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles. And, and if it was possible, they would have gave him an eye transplant. So it appears that the Apostle Paul had a problem with his eyes, which is kind of interesting in, in the sense that sometimes we think the healing. Now remember Acts chapter 9? Go back there. When Paul was converted, he's on the road to Damascus, and, and it says, uh, verse 3, And as he journeyed, he came near to Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. And uh, I guess it's another passage that says it was brighter than the sun. So, and he's blinded, yeah, by the time this is done. Uh, and he says he fell to the earth, 
and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It's hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And, and, and so he called him, and it says, uh, and he, verse 9, And he went about three days without sight, neither did he eat or drink, and then he's going to go to, to Ananias, it says in verse 12, and hath, Ananias had seen a vi- or the Lord's telling him that Paul had, Ananias, that Paul had seen a vision uh, of a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him that he might receive his sight. And so and it happens, verse 17, and Ananias went his way and entered into the house and putting his hands on him said, Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus, appeared unto thee in the way that thou, thou camest, hath sent me that thou mightest receive thy sight, now catch this other part as well, and be filled with the Holy Ghost, and immediately there fell from his eyes as it had been scales, and he received sight forwith, arose and was baptized. Now, you know, usually, and you know, I, you know, I could be wrong all about this, but it, you know, if, if he has an infirmity that really clear in Galatians seems to have an eye problem, and then you read here that when he saw this son, he scaled his eyes. And then when he received this healing, the scales fell from his eyes. That this might not be a full miraculous healing like we would, that the Lord normally did. Uh, that it seems like there is uh, some fallout from this. That it, it says Paul received his sight, so he's not totally blind. But I'm not sure that he's totally whole. That there seems to be something left from this appearance of the Lord. And that seems strange to say that, but that's what it seems to be. But, but the point is, is that when we're going to study at Acts chapter 13, beginning in verse 14, and all the, way through chapter, all the way through chapter 14, Paul's ministry, we're going to see his ministry in the area of Galatia. You need to realize that Paul's out there ministering with this handicap and no one to help him, no servant boy. No, John's not there to take care of his needs. So that he's, he's really uh, practicing. Uh, come over to 2 Corinthians. You're, I'm, most are familiar with this, but it fits right in with what we're talking about. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. And this is actually a later, even later than where we are, that the Lord's going to appear to him even more and give him more revelation than he got on that road to Damascus. But he tells us, how the Lord, what the Lord is doing with him because of the abundance of revelations, plural, that he's receiving. 2 Corinthians 12 and verse 7, the Apostle Paul speaking about himself says, Unless I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given unto me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. Now, Galatians talked about an infirmity of the flesh, right? Paul calls it here a thorn in the flesh, and that, that God has allowed Satan to be a thorn to the Apostle Paul. He's got a thorn in the flesh to keep him humble. Because with all the revelations in this chapter, he already talked about how he's already caught up into the third heaven and saw things that are unspeakable. So that he could, that could go to his head. God made sure it didn't. He gave him a messenger of Satan unless he be exalted above measure. Verse 8 says, For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. I never thought of it before, and I don't know for sure. But you know, the book of Acts is going to take us through Paul's three apostolic ministries. Of course, he wrote Galatians before the third one, but, uh, or wrote Corinthians before the third one. Actually, he wrote it during the third one. So, <laughs> anyhow, I was thinking... Can you imagine if he's out here and he's got an infirmity of the flesh, and if that infirmity of the flesh, that uh, messenger of Satan to buffet him, is he doesn't have good eye contact, that you could see him getting frustrated trying to do the work of the ministry and just stop and say, Lord, you got to take this from me. So he makes it through that time. Next time he goes back, and then he goes even further with the ministry, and you could say, Lord, now come on, <laughs> I need some help here. Then he takes a third apostolic, you know, he, it didn't say how soon, those, how close those three prayers were, but we just know in verse 8, these, the, uh, this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, now this is the, this is the lesson here, 
He said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Now that's the answer that Paul got. That is, Paul, he tells in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 that we're to be followers of him as he is of Christ. He tells us in 1 Timothy that he's a pattern of all who believe after him. And this is what life is under grace. You know, I don't know if you've caught on. It should be something that you have real clear in your mind. There, there's some basic Bible truths. And in 1 Corinthians 15, uh, 13, when it talks about tongues and prophecy and the gift of knowledge, you know, God just imparting things in your head, that when those things end, that, that they're going to end with the completed word of God, but then it's going to abide faith, hope, and charity, these three. And what we have going for us in the age of grace, everyone wants to go to the prophecy and the knowledge and the tongue speaking, but what God has given us to sustain us in the age of grace is faith, hope, and charity. Hope in the future promise that He's made for us. Faith, we understand why things are happening, are they, why they, how they're happening, because we have a completed Word of God. We can believe what God has said for us. And, and charity, God's Word and God's Spirit will motivate us to serve Him as we take in the information about grace. And, and Paul, he's going to be motivated by the love and grace of God to continue to minister. And when God said to him, my grace is sufficient, Paul, you don't need healed. You need to keep this infirmity because in your weakness, that's when I'm made strong. That's when, that's, uh, therefore, I, uh, no. For he said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee, for, for, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. God's strength in Paul, not Paul's strength. He's going to go on in the strength of the Lord. Writes Timothy, be strong in the Lord and the power of His might. Well, that's actually all of us in it. That's Ephesians 6. Uh, so Paul's reaction to that is in verse 9. Most gladly, therefore, I will glory in my infirmities. See, that thorn in the flesh, he's calling it an infirmity now, just like in Galatians, infirmity in the flesh. Most gladly I will glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore I take pleasure in infirmity and reproach and necessity. He don't even stop there. <laughs> he went past infirmities. <laughs> reproach, necessities, and persecution, distress for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. When he can't do it, that's when God can do it through him. So that's grace operating today. That, that's, that's what we're left with in the age of grace. I give you all that information now rather than waiting till we get to chapter 15 and realize that this departure of Mark was a big deal. It don't look that big of a deal in chapter 13. But then you begin to put it together when you read chapter 15 of Acts and realize it was a big deal. So much so that Barnabas and Paul never going to minister together as recorded in Scripture. But at the same time, I give, it, I give you this information now in chapter 13. So as we study Paul's ministry in that area, the region of Galatia, you'll realize that he's going there in the power of the Lord, in his physical weakness, and the Lord's going to sustain him. His grace is going to be sufficient as he ministers on. He's going there handicapped. And, uh, and so you should know that because you're not going to read it here. You'd, you'd think he's just a powerful little man. I always say little because they always say he was short. I don't know how they know that. But uh, anyhow... I think they say he's bald. I don't know why I got all this. I got the, I can picture him. I don't know why. Somebody probably said a bunch of lies and I took it in or something. <laughs> but uh, anyhow, that, that, that's the condition that the Apostle Paul is in when he is out there ministering. Um, so Paul is, is going to rely on the Lord's strength. He's going to learn to walk by faith, not by sight. <laughs> not, 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 not necessarily a pun, pun on words there, is there? Um, he, um, oh, that even with this handicap that he has, he has something much more powerful. Remember what Ananias said to him? I'm here that you might receive your sight and what? And be filled with the Holy Ghost. So if the Apostle Paul is going to go out there under the control of the Holy Spirit, he's got, he's got a strength that's a different kind of strength. It's, it's the power of the Spirit of God. And, and he has now, he has revelation, is going to receive more revelation that's going to give him insight on, on what God is doing and why he's suffering and how to handle those sufferings. And uh, 
and he can go out and he'll discover, as he does, that God's grace is indeed sufficient for him. And that's a testimony for you and me to realize his grace is sufficient for us. So he leaves there. Acts chapter 13. We have him over in that Perga of Pamphylia, but look at Acts 13, verse 14. It says, But when they departed from Perga, they came to Antioch in Poseidon, and went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and sat down. So, it doesn't, doesn't say they spent any time there. We're going to learn that Paul has a couple different uh, patterns of ministry that are, are unique. He, he leaves Paphos, he hits Perga in Pam- whoops, there it is, Perga and Pamphylia, but he doesn't stay in the seacoast city. He goes all the way up here, right to, to Antioch. And Antioch, that, that's a real important city. When Rome ruled, you know, they always say all roads lead to Rome, they built highways so that, you know, they could control all these areas. And that Antioch is a major city in that area. And when Paul hits the seacoast city, usually a seacoast city is a pretty major area, but he almost like beelines it for Antioch. And by the way, <laughs> make sure this is, this is real important. That's Antioch in this area is called Poseidon. Where's the word Poseidon? It's in, oh, yeah, Poseidon right here. So this whole area here, it's not Pamphylia, it's Poseidon, and it's Antioch Poseidon. I say that because, remember, he left from Antioch, but that's Antioch, Syria. So there's two cities called Antioch, and remember where he's at now. He's Antioch, Poseidon, and, and, and when he gets there. Now, in, the, in this chapter, we're about to come where Paul is going to preach his first message, or at least first recorded message. He's been preaching. We just don't know what he's been preaching. We know what he preached when he first got saved, but we don't know when he left uh, Antioch, Syria, and first went to Cyprus, we don't know what he preached. But we're, we're about to learn what he preached, but, but what, we're, what this chapter 13 is about is we see the, his ministry launched in verses 1 through 3, and then we see his ministry in Cyprus in verses uh, um, 4 through 12 there, actually, yeah, 4 through 12, and then, uh, and then now his ministry in Antioch Poseidon will be the rest of this chapter. In his ministry in Antioch, Poseidon, he, he gets there and the things that are going to take place. When we read verse 14, notice he goes into a synagogue on the Sabbath day and sat down. So it's interesting. His ministry begins with him entering in the city and sitting down in a synagogue. Then in, uh, in, the, in the next verse, he's going to stand up. Well, actually, verse 16, he's going to end up standing up because he's going to be invited to speak. And that's going to begin... Uh, Paul's first recorded message, which is going to be real significant for us to study. And, and then he began with him entering and sitting down. He stands up and he speaks, and that's verses uh, what, 16 through 49. And then look how the chapter ends, verse 50. It says, But the Jews stirred up the devout and honorable women and the chief men of the city and raised persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them out of their coasts. But they shook off the dust of their feet against them and came into Iconium. And the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Ghost. So he leaves there with a Jewish uprising and persecution, but a group of disciples that are filled with joy and the Holy Ghost. So he enters in sitting down, stands up to speak, and leaves behind a riot. <laughs> so that's kind of the, the whole gist of the chapter, but in between is when he got up to speak. So, uh, like I say, the, the, this section where Paul's first recorded message uh, is quite revealing in, in that, in that uh, he's going to go all through Israel's history and so forth. Let, let, let me first, when I said there's a couple things that the Apostle Paul does, as he ministers, we read this before in chapter 13 and verse 5. When he first went to the island of Cyprus, it says, And when they were at Salomus, he preached the word in the synagogue of the Jews. Now, we don't know what he preached there. It just said he did. And I told you back then that, you know, we'll eventually find out why he's going in the synagogue of the Jews. We're going to learn some things right from the beginning right now. But there'll be more things as we end this chapter why we'll understand why Paul starts out in the synagogue of the Jews. 
will certainly learn what he's saying when he goes into the synagogue because, just kind of reading ahead here, verse 15 says, And after the reading of the law and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent unto him, saying, Ye men and brethren, if ye have any word of exhortation for the people, say on. And Paul stood up and beckoned with his hands and said. So they're going to give him a platform to speak from. And uh, so Paul's going to have an opportunity to speak when he's in that synagogue. And, and like I say, we'll, we'll find out what he's teaching. But the question about why he goes into the synagogue, you begin to see right away, is that, that when he goes in there, he, he has an opportunity, like in this case, to speak. Um, come over to chapter 17. Just a reminder that later on when he launches his second ministry. Now when they had passed through Ampith... Am, Ampith... No, I can say that. Apollonus, anyhow. And Apollonii. They came to Thessalonica where was the synagogue of the Jews. And Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them and three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the Scriptures. I just want you to see, as his manner was. So... We know Paul kind of centers out a major city, and he also finds the synagogue in that city, and he starts there, and, uh, and so that, that becomes a pattern of his. Now, understand that when we talk about, going back to chapter 13 there, that he enters into uh, Antioch, Poseidon, and went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and sat down. So he's just kind of going in and sitting down. Uh, he's going to get an opportunity, but understand that a synagogue is not a temple. Sometimes we study all about Israel's temple, and, and uh, we know more about the temple than we really do about synagogues. But what synagogues are, synagogues, when I, when I studied synagogue, I found out they're just like going to church uh, from Bible days. They probably are, I don't know exactly what they do, I've never dropped in. Anybody ever dropped in one? There's a guy, we called him Roman, not Roman that comes here, but... Uh, he, we call him Roman because he always quote in the book of Romans. <laughs> he, he was from uh, Pastor Taylor's assembly. Uh, but anyhow, last I heard, that's all he does is goes to synagogues. <laughs> he even grew a beard. <laughs> and he goes in there to tell them about the gospel of the uncircumcision. <laughs> but, but he almost, he has, he, he, what he explained to me is, he's, what, Paul, you got something to say, say it. They had free course. What, what a synagogue was, it was a place they're not temples, like I said. A temple is the place in Jerusalem where sacrifices and the priesthood was done. But synagogues are places where the Jews outside of Jerusalem, and even in Jerusalem they had synagogues, but they're, they're, they're places where people would come on the Sabbath day to study the Bible. They would actually come, and from what I understand, they would sing songs. There's a scripture reading. Remember when the Lord began his ministry and he went to Calpurnium and he, he goes into the synagogue and they were reading out of the book. He, he was invited to read. He read out of the book of Isaiah and he says, this day is it fulfilled in your ears. That they, they actually would come together and from what I understand, they'd sing songs. They would read the scriptures. They'd have a word of prayer. They'd have Bible study. And, uh, and, and so when Paul would go to the synagogue there, that was a place where they were seeking out Bible study. And so you, they're there, and then after the reading of the Law and the Prophets, that's when they, they were invited to, to say something. Um, you know, later on, when the Apostle Paul does establish churches, look over in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, no, chapter 14. When Paul, remember, until the Word of God was complete, and God began to establish Gentile body of Christ assemblies that he would give, he would raise up in the church prophets. And the people in the church would come together. They didn't have, like you and I come together, we're studying the Bible. Well, unless Paul wrote the book of Corinthians, when they come together, they couldn't read Corinthians. Eventually, they'll have the book of Corinthians, and eventually they'll have the whole Bible. And when they have the whole Bible, prophecy and tongues, and the supernatural gift of knowledge is going to end. That's what we were just talking about. But until it did end, Paul gave regulations to the churches, and, and I guess I'm just pointing out that what Paul is saying to the churches at Corinth are things that almost match exactly what went on daily in the synagogue. That uh, over in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 29, he says, 
the, the prophets, uh, let the prophets speak two or three and let another judge. Uh, if, any man, if, if anything be revealed to another that sitteth by, let him first hold his peace. For ye may all prophesy one by one that all may learn and all may be comforted. The spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. Uh, for God is not uh, the author of confusion, but of peace and in all the churches of the saints. So what it is, he's saying now, if we read on, you find out they don't have the same requirements under tongues. Tongues, two, the most, can three people, and only if they have an interpreter, and women weren't allowed to do it. When it comes to prophets, and, and men, women can't prophesy either. They, if they are prophets, they could tell their, son, their husband at home and ask their husband about it at home, as it says. But anyhow, when it comes to prophecy, all may prophesy. If God's speaking to someone, everybody, all the men of the assembly, it's not limited to two or three, all may speak, but they have to do it one at a time. And, and, uh, and they can't just say, oh, the Spirit said something, and, and then interrupt somebody else. They're, the spirit of the prophets are subject to the prophets. That is, they can wait their turn so that everything can be done decently in order. The opposite of what goes on in churches when they're speaking in tongues all at the same time. Not, none of that is biblical at all. But uh, when I was thinking about the synagogue, like Paul and them walked in, and they says, y you men, you have word of exhortation, say on. You got a word of God, we want to hear it. Well, that was happening it, it, when, when Paul established local churches. That's how God used to work in Gentile churches. But that's, Jews were already doing that in synagogues before Gentile had their churches. So when I, when I now think about a Jewish synagogue, I, I think about it just like coming together on a, on, a, on, a, on a Sunday for us. They would get together on a Saturday, and, uh, and they would do some of the same things that we're doing as far as singing and praying and Bible studies. So that's what a synagogue is. And... And, uh, and so that kind of gives you some insight then to why the Apostle Paul would start at a synagogue. At least one of the reasons that he would start there is he'd have a platform to speak from. Uh, chapter 13 again, verse 15. He said, and So he goes in, he just sits down, sitting there quietly. Verse 15, After the reading of the law and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent unto him, saying, Ye men and brethren, if ye have any word of exhortation for the people... Say on. One time we had a say on service here. <laughs> that, that, that catches me every time. We, and we just had a night service, and I just wanted the men to come, and if they had a word of exhortation, say on. You know, I, I get to exhort all the time because I'm preaching and have opportunity. I got the floor. But sometimes you guys study something. Sometimes there's something you see, something maybe an admonition for the saints. And so one time we just had a service where it was a night service, one of preaching time, and we called it a say on service. If you men, you got a word of, of, for the people, say on. <laughs> so anyhow, that Paul had a platform here uh, to speak from in the synagogue. And when he did, he says in verse 16, Then Paul stood up and beckoning with his hand, I, I don't know why that's in the scriptures, except, <laughs> well, he, he's going to, He's doing everything to get people to listen. What I mean is why God is telling us that he beckoned with his hands. I guess maybe just uh, to show that he's really going to plea with the people, really try to get their interest, try to get them to listen. Uh, but anyhow, then Paul stood up and, and beckoning with his hands said, Men of Israel and ye that fear God, give audience. Now Paul's got an audience in the synagogue. And notice there's two different groups of people in that synagogue that, that's listening to him. He says, ye men of Israel. Well, that's what we'd expect to be in the synagogue, right? Jews. But when he says, and ye that fear God, there's some Gentiles in that synagogue. Look over in verse 26. He, it says, men and brethren... Children of the stock of Abraham, and whosoever among you feareth God, to you is the word of this salvation sent. So in that synagogue, the, the, it's not, you know, like sometimes it's uh, ye men of Israel and ye that fear God, meaning ye in Israel who fear God. But there's actually two groups of people there. When he says whosoever among you feareth God, 
you, like I told you, that man today still goes to synagogue. You are invited to a synagogue. You can go in just like we invite people into our church. You as a Gentile, now you have to do their laws and probably put a beanie on or whatever you have to do. I, I'm actually a little afraid to go in there myself. <laughs> but, uh, but anyhow, Gentiles back in Bible days, the, see, Gentiles, they were pagans for the most part, worshiping idols. But, you know, it doesn't take much intelligence to realize that a piece of stone or a hunk of gold or, or a piece of metal is not a god, especially a cow or any kind of animal. And so some Gentiles heard about Israel that they serve the true and living God, a God that's not made with hands, one who's actually alive, who's in the heavens, and they're, they're supposed to be God's chosen people. And so some Gentiles become God-fearing Gentiles in the fact that they think twice about worshiping idols and want to learn more about the God of Israel, and they're allowed to come in and sit in the back of the synagogue and learn about Israel's God. One of the, we already studied one of those guys. Come over to chapter 10. There was a man, verse 1, in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of the band called the Italian band, a devout man, and one that feared God, the right God. He's given to the nation of Israel. He, so Cornelius is one of those Gentiles. Now, there is Gentiles who can become circumcised, but then they're no longer considered Gentiles. They're considered proselytes uh, later on in this passage. Uh, this is like, it's only the book of Acts that ever talks about proselytes, I believe. Uh, what's that verse? Well, anyhow, late. oh, there it is, verse 43. And when the congregation was broken, uh, chapter 13, verse 43. And when the congregation was broken up, many of the Jews and religious proselytes followed. So there is Jews, there's proselyte Gentiles, but there's just Gentiles that are God-fearing Gentiles. And Paul, when he stands up to address them, in, in, he, he is addressing two groups of people, which now tells you another reason why it would be that Paul would go into the synagogue of the Jews. Not only did he have an opportunity to speak, he has an opportunity to speak to both Jew and Gentiles, because as we know, when you get over to verse 39, and by him all that believe are justified from all things, that is, by him all that believe. He's got a message for both Jew and Gentile. And he's got a place where he can go speak, and not only speak to the nation of Israel, but speak to some Gentiles that already have the fear of God in them. And he's going to tell both about Jesus Christ and how to be saved. So we see another reason why it is that the Apostle Paul would start out at a synagogue. There's more reasons as we go on, but we see that. Uh, verse 17 again, it says, Then God, uh, then God, uh, the God, no, he'd give audience. Verse 17, he's going to begin starting. He said, The God of this people of Israel chose our fathers and exalted the people when they dwelt as strangers in the land of Egypt, and with a high arm brought he them out of it. Now, you know what I think I, I want to do here is, rather than start into the study of, of what Paul's going to do, let me, let me give you a little bit of outline. Of what, when I study a chapter, like I just showed you the three sections that I looked at the chapter, well, now we're in a section which is a major section uh, that uh, from verse 14 all the way to verse 49. And there's going to be a breakdown in verse 41, but the, where Paul's going to preach. And, you know, as a preacher, when I preach, I, <laughs> I have outlines. <laughs> I have points I'm trying to get across. Paul has an outline. There is something he's expressing. It, it, it's helpful for you to see the overview of what he's going to do. Notice he's going to start in verse 17 talking about the history of Israel leading up to Jesus Christ. You know, the God of this people of Israel chose our fathers and exalted them when they dwelt in the land of Egypt, and with a high arm brought he them out of it. So he's going to go all the way back to Israel coming out of Egypt. He's going to start where Israel actually was multiplied into a great nation. In Genesis, there's only 70 souls that come out with Abraham and, and uh, or excuse me, with uh, uh, Jacob, where Joseph brought them into Egypt. There's, there's only 70 Jewish people that come into Egypt. But when they leave Egypt, there's a couple million of them. 
So Israel multiplied in the land of Israel, and that's where Paul's going to pick up them coming out. And he's going to trace their history, and it's interesting how he does this. He's going to lead up to David in verse 22, and how David's, all the promises are fulfilled in Jesus Christ in verse 23, and then bring up the, the Lord Jesus Christ ministry, or the introduction of Jesus Christ ministry of John the Baptist in verse 24 and 25. So he's going through history all that time from Israel leaving Egypt right up to the Lord Jesus Christ. And then he stops. And notice verse 26. Now see, if you, if you read this on your own, you'll see how it goes. He's, he's going history after history after history. And that's broken down in a way that we, we need to look at it broken down. But he's going through all the history of Israel. And then verse 26 should jump, jump right out at you. He says, men and brethren... Children of the stock of Abraham, and whosoever among you feareth God, to you is the word of this salvation sent. See, he led up to something, and then you can see there's a break in his message right there, where he quit talking about history, and he brought him, hey, you guys, I'm talking to you guys. And he starts, but then from that point, he goes through the recent history of the nation of Israel, not the ancient history. He starts talking about how Jesus Christ came and was crucified and God raised him from the dead in verses 26 through 31 there. And then verse 32 he says, And we declare unto you glad tidings, how that the promise which was made unto the fathers. So you see another break there where he now went through the rejection of Jesus Christ and resurrection and then he's back to preaching to them again. Brings it right up to date. So... So he, he does that, and then, and then when he finishes, it will give the gospel real clear, he finishes with a warning. Look at verse 40. Beware, therefore, lest there come upon you that which was spoken in the prophets. Behold, ye despisers, and wander and perish. For I work a work in your day, a work which ye shall, not, ye shall in no wise believe, though a man declare it unto you. Now that's the end. Oh, oh. Yeah, that's the end of his message in verse 41. I call it part one of his message. <laughs> because he brought them up to a point and then gives them a real strong warning. Now if you see that, even this week when you're reading through that, think back of all the different places in history that he's pointing out. Because every place in history that he points out, Israel had failed God. And then he ends with a warning. Look, I'm giving you the salvation that's in Jesus Christ through his resurrection, offering you, verse 38 and 39, Be it known unto you therefore, men and brethren, that through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins, and by him all that believe are justified from all things which he could not be justified by the law of Moses. He's offering them salvation. Then he warns them, beware, you turn this down, something's going to happen that you won't believe. I'm going to tell you ahead of time, and when it happens you won't believe it. And, and, and then there's a reaction to his message because the Gentiles say, hey, wait a minute, he's got something to say to us? The Jews get jealous, and, and then they look at, look at verse uh, 45. And when the Jews saw the multitude, they were filled with envy and spake against those things which were spoken by Paul, noticing, counterdicting and blaspheming. So now there's, there's a reaction. The Jews don't like the Gentiles being a part of this message that Paul has. They start counterdicting and blaspheming Paul's message, blaspheming the Holy Ghost. It says in verse 46, and this is our last section, I call it the last part of his message. Then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said it was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you. But seeing you put it from you and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles, for so the Lord commanded us. That's, that's the message that they won't believe, though a man declare it unto them. <laughs> that, that God is going to actually turn from Israel to the Gentiles. And, uh, and, and so you, you get this, the follow-up message uh, and the warning that Paul warned him about, the consequences take place and the fulfillment takes place of his warning. So you get a, a good gist of it there. And we'll, when we come back next week, we'll actually uh, go through. And I, I've been picking apart <laughs> that message so that uh, we're going to look at detail. And, th and what it is... Now you're going to see that you're going to be able to outline the Old Testament from what the Apostle Paul is going to say. But he's going to take you from the Old Testament up to the rejection of Christ. Warning of Old Testament, warning of Jesus Christ, warning about blaspheming the Holy Spirit.
Let's pray. Our God and our Father, we, we thank you for the opportunity that we have in your grace. Certainly you've provoked the nation of Israel to jealousy and uh, by turning to us Gentiles. And Father, I, I pray that we'll rejoice in the opportunity that we have in this age of grace. I pray that we'll also realize that in this age of grace, as the Apostle Paul struggled to preach the message to us in the weakness of his flesh, but in your power, that, Father, we might realize that that is the way that you'd want to work in each one of us so that as we face difficulties in life, that we don't get discouraged about our own weakness, but realize there's an opportunity in this weakness to actually see you work in a more powerful way than if we had our own strength to do it. So help us to learn these lessons and communicate it and to keep growing in grace and knowledge. Bring us back again next week, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Well, they're lost. Paul's just now giving them the gospel. They're, they haven't... Well, you're getting, you're getting all the way to the conclusion. We haven't even gone through the message. Yeah, the... Yeah, the, well, certainly the ones who reject... The offer of forgiveness through Jesus Christ, they're lost, yeah. <laughs>